Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on one of the interesting topics and this particular topic is for the students of philosophy as well as all those who are interested in learning the philosophies. So dear friends, today we are going to discuss on mind-body dualism. Now you might be wondering what we are talking about. So if you have any kind of question arising right now, we will be answering to all of of your questions. Dear friends, we would like to tell you all that for this discussion on uh, mind-body dualism. We have once again with us in our studios Dr. Ajay Burma. Dr. Ajay Burma is Associate Professor in Center for uh, Philosophy School of uh, Social Sciences and uh, uh, dear friends, we would like to tell you all that uh, if you want to ask questions from uh, Dr. Ajay Burma, then you can call right in the studios. You can contact us through our toll-free number. Our toll-free number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat. Uh, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. You are requested to call in the last ten minutes of the lecture. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Ajarma, and let's try to have deep insight into today's topic. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you. Uh, hello friends, so as uh, you are already aware, we uh, would be discussing uh, one of the perennial issues uh, in, in philosophy, uh, namely uh, mind-body dualism. Uh, but before we start discussing uh, uh, you know, the dualism part of it, uh, you must realize that mind-body dualism uh, is an answer to a particular issue or to a particular uh, philosophical problem that's been uh, and that has bothered uh, and that's been bothering uh, in many philosophers since uh, very uh, early times. So, uh, first of all, and before we, we, before we start discussing uh, uh, what exactly we mean by mind-body uh, dualism, first of all, we should try and understand what exactly is the question to which, uh, you know, the theory of uh, mind-body dualism uh, is, 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 uh, is responding to. So in that connection, first of all, you must understand uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the nature of mind-body problem. What exactly uh, do we understand by mind-body problem to which uh, mind-body dualism is, uh, is uh, one of the many answers that's, that is suggested. <clears throat> So, uh, having said that, maybe uh, you know a good, a good idea you know, to, to, to sort of uh, to uh, to understand uh, you know, what exactly is mind-body problem. Uh, I would like to read a small passage from a book by uh, Neil Campbell titled "A Brief." Uh, Introduction to Philosophy of Mind, uh, where he says that uh, the mind-body problem is generated by two fairly simple observations. The first is that we all have bodies and that our bodies are not a complete mystery to science. We believe that science has a great deal to tell us about how our bodies function and what they are made of. Furthermore, although they are, there are distinct differences in complexity, we tend to think that our bodies are not fundamentally different from other physical objects in the world around us, such as chairs, rocks, or trees. Secondly, we also have minds. We think, feel, dream, desire, and engage in a variety of other mental activities. In this respect, we are different from most of the physical objects we encounter on a daily basis. Chairs, rocks, and trees are not conscious. They don't feel think, dream, or have desires of any kind. The mind-body problem concerns the nature of relationship between these two aspects of our nature, between our thinking selves and our physical selves. So, uh, this passage makes uh, you know, the nature of uh, mind-body problem uh, uh, fairly clear to us. Uh, but you know, to, to elaborate a little further uh, on this issue, we must realize that if we look at uh, history of philosophy, some of the earliest uh, ideas, uh, whether you know, it was uh, in Indian philosophy or whether it was uh, in, in Greek philosophy, were concerning uh, uh, were concerning what exactly is uh, you know the stuff that that uh, that uh, the entire uh, universe is is composed of. So one of the very early questions that uh, that many philosophers uh, you know engaged with was uh, the ultimate uh, stuff of the universe, which also you know uh, brings us uh, to the question regarding origins of the universe. So uh, you know if we find uh, if if we look uh, at uh, the history of uh, Indian philosophy, then we'll find that uh, some of the earlier philosophical ruminations in, in uh, Indian philosophy, uh, namely in Vedas. 
which are uh, some of the earliest known uh, philosophical texts that are uh, available uh, to humanity, then we find that there are several passages which explore uh, uh, so to speak, the beginning, the very beginning, the origin of, of uh, uh, everything that we have around us, the origin of the universe as such, and, and uh, two important, uh, two important uh, 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 parts uh, in, in, in Rig Veda uh, regarding that is uh, Nasadi Sukta and Purush Sukta. Uh, but if we look at uh, the, the history of Western philosophy, which is uh, what you know, we are going to discuss today, then there we also find that uh, the very early Greek thought, uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, were uh, mainly engaged in uh, trying to uh, trying to contemplate on uh, the ultimate stuff of the universe. The term for that uh, was uh, archai. Uh, so uh, what they were engaged uh, with was you know, they were trying to find out what uh, could possibly be the the ultimate stuff uh, which would. Uh, which would explain a rising of, uh, you know, a rising in composition, a rising in going away and composition of uh, everything that we see around us. So one of the earliest uh, uh, Greek philosophers uh, uh, that's known to us, namely Thales, thought that probably the ultimate stuff or the archai of, of uh, the universe is is water, and then an eximander, an eximene, an eximenes, and and so on and so forth thought that it could be uh, it could be air, uh, and and so on and so forth. So uh, what we are trying to get at uh, here is that. Uh, that uh, very early uh, philosoph philosophical ruminations were uh, focused upon uh, what exactly <coughs> is the composition, uh, what are the what are the basic uh, uh, what is the basic stuff uh, you know that uh, that 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 could explain uh, everything uh, uh, in the universe. So the mainly the main focus was uh, you know the 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 physical uh, sort of presence of of so many things around us. And 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 what uh, could be the ultimate lying stuff? What could be the ultimate lying substance uh, behind you know, the multiplicity of uh, multiplicity and plurality of things that we see around us? But then, uh, then uh, uh, the focus uh, you know later on shifts. Uh, in, 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 by the time Socrates uh, comes into the picture, the focus shifts from the n nature of uh, physical things to uh, what should we do with our lives, uh, what to do given, you know, the, 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 this very structure of, of, of the universe around us. Though, so the question uh, you know, shifted from, uh, from, from the nature of uh, things around us to, to the ethical question uh, concerning uh, uh, what to do with our lives, what's the best course of action, what should I do, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth, what, what is, uh, you know, the notion of justice, what is, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and uh, by the time Plato, uh, you know, comes into the picture, then, uh, you know, he sort of uh, uh, combines the two questions together and, and takes up questions like, uh, you know, the notion of justice, uh, how should it be, how should it be analyzed at, at, at metaphysical level and so on. So, uh, what we are trying to get at here is that, uh, that the uh, that you know, the, the early, uh, very early on in Greek philosophy, uh, philosophers were only concerned, were mainly concerned, and only concerned in a certain way with uh, with the physical nature of things. But even if we have, we know for sure the physical nature of things, then you know, even then some. Uh, some other, uh, you know, things seem to be left out, uh, namely that, you know, certain questions regarding, uh, which in which concern uh, the contemplation as such. So, uh, certain notions, you know, which, which concern us in a very different way, like, uh, like in the notion of justice, sociopolitical questions, so on and so forth, their nature is very different. Uh, so, so uh, the idea here is that, uh, you know, physics of uh, you know the the, the uh, knowledge of uh, so to speak the physics of the world 
around us probably would not be a complete knowledge in a certain sense. So therefore, uh, you know, there, there, there's something else that we we, we, know, we, we want to know about uh, about you know our, sort of our world at large, namely uh, you know the, the the right course of action questions regarding justice and so on and so forth, which seem to belong to a different realm altogether. So historically speaking, uh, there are these uh, you know sort of two two different kind of questions that we took up. And and uh, you know and and then uh, you know different kind of answers coming uh, forth from there, and but you know there has to be some kind of a single thread running between these two questions. So so uh, Plato you know tries to sort of uh, do some kind of uh, you know try, uh, Plato tries to engage in the met, you know in, in metaphysics of of uh, of uh, certain notions which don't seem to be purely physical in nature. So, he tries to, uh, you know, define even physical in terms of uh, some abstract notions like form. So, uh, in a certain sense, uh, uh, mind-body problem, uh, you know, was implicit in uh, ever since uh, uh, the, the, the times of uh, some of the earliest ruminations on, on uh, philosophical nature of things and it becomes more pronounced uh, by the time uh, Plato comes onto the scene. But uh, we will talk uh, about that uh, a little later on. But uh, you know, having understood the nature of uh, the mind-body problem, uh, we must also notice that uh, there are two uh, different kind of questions that we could ask about the mind-body problem. Uh, one of these questions regards, uh, uh, you know, belongs belongs to, so to speak, uh, the ontology of things. Uh, ontology, namely the study of, you know, of being or study of existence of, of uh, things. And the other is, uh, you know, uh, epistemological in nature. So, what are these uh, two different kinds of uh, questions that uh, that arise uh, from uh, mind-body problem? To understand that, I would uh, like to uh, read again a passage from uh, from uh, the same text by uh, Neil Campbell. He says. Uh, the first and most significant uh, uh, problem regarding mind-body problem is the ontological problem. Ontology is the study of being of what there is in the universe. The ontological problem is concerned with the question what kind of thing is a human being. It explores whether we are merely complex physical bodies or whether we also have non-physical minds or souls in addition to our bodies. Uh, second of these problems is the epistemological one. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. It explores how we acquire knowledge and what uh, the differences are between knowledge and opinion. In the context of the mind-body problem, the epistemological problem examines questions about our knowledge of other minds, such as how do we know uh, what other people think, feel or believe? How do we know that other people have minds? These are difficult questions because persons' mental states seem to be a very different kind of thing from their physical traits. Uh, for example, we can determine if uh, someone is right or left-handed by watching them sign their name or drink a glass of water, but we cannot so easily know what a person thinks, feels or believes, especially if that person is private about uh, their thoughts uh, and feelings. We cannot simply observe what another person believes in the way we can observe that another person is left-handed. So, uh, this gives us fairly good idea regarding uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, what are the, you know, the different, mainly two set of questions that, uh, that you know, could concern us uh, from, uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, mind-body problem. The one, uh, one and, and, and the uh, foremost problem is the ontological problem, uh, namely, namely uh, what kind of, uh, you know, thing is a human being and human being uh, seems to have you know see human beings as human beings we seem to be a complex of physical body and uh, but at the same time since we are also capable of ruminating about and capable of thinking about things uh, which as a matter of it includes our uh, physical bodies as well 
So since uh, uh, we are uh, you know not only aware of uh, physical bodies but also sort of you know we, we are able to uh, raise different problems, we are able to think about them and, and uh, so on and so forth. We are able to also think about thinking as such. Uh, and uh, you know, not only we know uh, you know sort of physical th objects in the world, but uh, you know we we could uh, sort of uh, in turn we could also in turn problematize the very notion of knowledge. So knowledge uh, and knowing and thinking as a process uh, seems to belong to a different order of of ontology of things. So uh, in ontological terms. There are material things which uh, seem to be purely physical in nature, and uh, and and uh, apart from that, uh, since you know we know that we are thinking beings, and uh, you know we are objectively able to think even about ourselves, uh, so it requires some kind of an objectific objectification, and you know sort of moving uh, epistemologically away from uh, the object of of knowledge. So it requires, you know, some kind of dichotomization, uh, you know, with the with the very object of of study. So since you know we generally assume that uh, knower and and uh, and the known are two different things, so that dichotomy seems to uh, carry over, uh, you know, in ontological terms as well. This, you know, sort of uh, it, it makes us kind of uh, uh, plausible to believe that. Uh, that there are physical bodies and there are sort of uh, and those physical bodies uh, you know especially especially if you're talking about human beings uh, physical bodies can also have a very different kind of faculty namely mind so uh, so this is what we could call the ontological problem uh, if, if we have both body and the mind uh, then you know the ontology of uh, these these two different spheres uh, needs to be explained, and uh, also along with that uh, another problem is uh, you know regarding how these two kind of uh, combine uh, in a human person because human person seems to be a, a kind of a complex of of both. Uh, mind and the body. So, uh, whereas epistemology, uh, 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 epistemological problem regarding more regarding mind body is of a very different kind, uh, you know, which includes a uh, uh, problem of other mind. How do how can we know, uh, of, uh, you know, what what's uh, uh, what are the thoughts that are uh, that are occurring in in somebody else's mind? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so questions like that. So, uh, when we talk about uh, mind-body dualism, we are uh, not so much concerned about uh, the epistemological questions that uh, we just uh, uh, saw. Uh, we are more concerned about uh, the ontological problem, uh, namely, uh, you know, what is the nature of uh, human being, and if human being is defined both in terms of mind as well as body, then how do we explain? Uh, explain uh, you know some kind of uh, relationship between uh, between the two of them so now having understood that uh, we could uh, now you know sort of try to reconnect uh, uh, with with what we were talking uh, about earlier so so if we look at uh, the history of western thought uh, there especially in, a, in during greek period we find that uh, uh, in some very uh, sort of uh, in, in some very in, in some not so direct way, uh, the first uh, probably Greek thinker to so to sort of uh, to anticipate in a certain way uh, you know mind body problem was was uh, Plato, uh, because first of all you know he talks about uh, sort of uh, he talks about different. Uh, uh, so to speak, uh, different uh, sort of units in, in in a human person, and and you know he talks about uh, uh, intellect, uh, appetites, and 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 uh, so on and so forth, and he thinks that these different faculty in faculties in in in, uh, in within us. Uh, uh, are there to perform, uh, you know, different uh, activities, so to speak? So, mind, you know, uh, so you know, the body is is uh, sort of associated more, uh, uh, is is viewed more in terms of uh, 
uh, certain kind of appetites uh, that uh, that you know that uh, uh, that uh, are woven into it uh, that are sort of that sort of seem to define it give, give that seem to give it a drive towards uh, some particular ends uh, and at the same time uh, intellect uh, you know is is, uh, is is a faculty which which uh, in a certain way uh, uh, makes us uh, aspire uh, and go beyond uh, the the appetites uh, you know of of the body which seem to according to plato seem to add to our weight of being and seem to you know bog us down so <clears throat> So now to sort of talk about uh, uh, how uh, uh, the mind-body problem uh, is is anticipated or or sort of you know very indirectly uh, seems to seems to occur in in very early early uh, classical Greek thought. Uh, I we could read a small passage from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. There uh, we find that Plato believed in the immortality of the human soul as well as in the reality of forms. The soul was, he thought, an entity that was fundamentally distinct from the body, although it could be and often was affected by its association with the body, being dragged down by what he called in one passage the laden weights of becoming. The soul was simple, not composite, and thus not liable to dissolution, as were material things. Further, it had the power of self-movement, again in contrast to material things. Ideally, the soul should rule and guide the body, and it could ensure that this situation persisted by seeing that the bodily appetites were indulged to the minimum extent necessary for the continuance of life. So as uh, as uh, uh, I stated earlier, uh, the main idea in Plato was that uh, body was viewed as a very different kind of uh, sort of uh, faculty of of, uh, of of a human person or for human being as such. Uh, bodily appetites were supposed to be uh, certain drives which added, so to speak, the weight to our existence. Uh, and in order to uh, you know sort of uh, uh, free ourselves from that. Uh, from that uh, weight, uh, the 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 so to speak soteriology that is proposed by uh, Plato is that uh, that uh, we also have intellect uh, through which uh, you know we could we could uh, sort of uh, try and and uh, contemplate about. Uh, uh, the forms of things, uh, form, uh, form uh, you know, basically would mean very broadly speaking, is something uh, that makes the makes the things uh, what they are. So uh, things uh, be, you know come to have, so to speak, uh, a nature uh, when they when they participate in in, in 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 certain forms. And so he imagines that there is a world of forms, uh, forms which are completely abstract, and therefore. Therefore, uh, you know, this world of forms is, is beyond uh, the world of time and space. So, uh, forms, uh, you know, are, are uh, sort of not subject to time and, uh, time and space contingencies. And uh, these forms, uh, which, uh, so to speak, uh, give meaning, uh, because of which the world around us in a certain way becomes intelligible at all, uh, uh, you know, uh, could be known only through intellect, uh, body, you know, sort of, uh, it cannot be known uh, through, through uh, bodily appetites because bodily appetites uh, you know, just sort of keep uh, keep our existence uh, limited to, to, to you know to to ourselves. Whereas uh, through our intellect, uh, we could contemplate about the actual nature of things, and through that com- contemplation, uh, we could uh, sort of uh, get certain kind of. Uh, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, proper knowledge, uh, you know, which is which is uh, named as episteme by Plato. And in order to do that, uh, we'll have to sort of work upon our bodily appetites and, and indulge in them to the minimum extent, uh, according to Plato. Uh, so, so uh, uh, in in continuation with that, you know, in a very important uh, uh, text of Plato, where uh, you know this this uh, distinction between, uh, even though you know he talks about this distinction not only in uh, one uh, dialogue, but in several, uh, which includes Republic as well. 
but uh, Phaedo is uh, Phaedo is one of the texts by Plato where uh, his views on this distinction become uh, are, are even more are more pronounced than probably uh, some other dialogues. So now to read uh, a passage uh, regarding uh, uh, mind body dualism in in in, uh, in Plato, uh, I, I would like to read a passage from uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. Uh, so in Phaedo, Plato believed that the true substances are not physical bodies, which are ephemeral. Uh, but the eternal forms of which bodies are imperfect copies. Uh, these forms not only make the world possible, they also make it intelligible because they perform the role of universals or what Frege called concepts. It is their connection with intelligibility that is relevant to the philosophy of mind because forms are the grounds of intelligibility they are what the intellect must grasp in the process of understanding. Uh, furthermore, uh, in Phaedo, Plato presents a variety of arguments for the immortality of, so, of the soul. But the one that is relevant for our purposes is that the intellect is immaterial because forms are immaterial and intellect must have an affinity with the forms it apprehends. This affinity is so strong that the soul strives to leave the body in which it is imprisoned and to dwell in the realm of forms. It may take many reincarnations before this is achieved. Plato's dualism is not therefore simply a doctrine in the philosophy of mind, but an integral part of his whole metaphysics. One problem with Plato's dualism was that though he speaks of the soul as imprisoned in the body, there is no clear account of what binds a particular soul to a particular body. Their difference in nature makes the union a mystery. So as clear from, uh, from uh, this passage, uh, intellect is supposed to be uh, not material in nature, whereas, philosophy, uh, whereas body is supposed to be material in nature for the reason that uh, intellect, uh, uh, you know, which is which is uh, you know, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, which is associated with with the soul, uh, is is uh, you know is concerned with uh, with forms, and forms are immaterial, so. Since forms are immaterial, therefore only something that is immaterial can actually have some kind of a direct connection with it. So therefore, soul uh, and intellect uh, uh, must be not of the nature of material because if it were of the nature of material, then it would not have been possible for it to be able to, to, to be able to comprehend uh, you know the world of uh, forms uh, forms being uh, pure abstract in nature and uh, since there's nothing so to speak uh, material about about forms because they are uh, they are beyond time and space contingencies only when when these uh, forms are subject to uh, time and space contingencies that uh, you know, they, they so to speak uh, uh, manifest themselves uh, you know, as, as imperfect copies in the in the material world so uh, so intellect uh, uh, and, and soul being uh, faculty which is associated with forms and since form uh, is uh, you know, the world of form or the forms are immaterial therefore soul has to be of the nature of immaterial say a soul cannot be therefore of the nature of material and uh, and and uh, this you know in a certain way creates a kind of uh, you know a complete uh, complete uh, wedge uh, between a complete dichotomy absolute dichotomy between the nature of uh, body uh, or for that matter nature of anything that is material which includes body uh, uh, and and in in, in uh, plato's metaphysics body which uh, which you know which uh, which has certain uh, appetites of its own and uh, and the mind or the soul uh, intellect which is completely of a different nature so there comes to be some kind of a very uh, very very complete kind of an absolute kind of a uh, wedge uh, between you know these two realms so in this way in this way uh, 
in Plato we find uh, some, some kind of very early uh, appearances of uh, mind uh, body problem. So friends uh, we will uh, continue with our discussion on uh, mind body dualism, uh, we will take a short break here and uh, we will return uh, very soon, uh, thank you. talking about uh, mind body dualism and uh, we were talking about uh, what kind of uh, you know very early contemplation about this uh, is, is found in, in uh, some uh, in some early Greek thinkers among them mainly Plato and we found that uh, how according to him since uh, since intellect and soul you know is, is concerned with uh, the world of forms therefore it has to be of a very different nature and and uh, and uh, bodily appetites the body and its uh, appetites are concerned with uh, you know is are, are supposed to be of a sort of different nature uh, namely uh, you know more, which has more to do with with the with the material nature of things so we find this kind of uh, rift between mind and body, uh, you know, uh, appearing in in, in uh, Plato's uh, uh, Plato's text. Uh, but you know, as as, as pointed out, uh, one problem with Plato's dualism was that though he speaks of the soul as imprisoned in the body, especially in Phaedo, you know, he talks about uh, uh, he he sort of he gives a very uh, sort of beautiful met metaphorical kind of a picture of how soul uh, gradually develops wings. Uh, when when you know you start uh, we start reflecting on the nature of uh, of, of uh, when we're reflecting on on you know the world of forms and then it wants to so to speak uh, uh, go or uh, you know uh, wants to rise above and wants to go beyond the uh, physical realm of of being uh, bodily realm of being but uh, in his metaphysics, there is no clear account of what binds a particular soul to a particular body in the first place. Uh, otherwise, we could uh, th th that could have counted as uh, some kind of an uh, you know some kind of an answer to how mind in a certain way interacts with the body. So, in in, in his metaphysics, these seem to, seem to be two different um, kind of realm altogether. But since uh, uh, both these faculties are supposed to be together uh, in 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 a, in a human being, so there was also uh, you know there's also a need to explain how uh, these two faculty uh, kind of coexist uh, in 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 the same location. So. So their difference in nature, uh, uh, you know, uh, makes the union a mystery, and union is something uh, that is not something contingent, uh, because I mean, in in any human being, these both faculties are together, so they are inevitably linked. They are inevitably in some kind of a union with each other in in a human being, uh, which requires uh, some kind of explanation, which uh, which you know we don't. Uh, find in, in you know explicated anywhere in in, uh, in uh, most of the texts of Plato. Now uh, after Plato uh, Aristotle uh, is uh, another uh, another very important uh, thinker uh, uh, of, of early uh, classical uh, you know Greek uh, 
Times, uh, who again, uh, not uh, very directly, but uh, sort of you find some kind of early early uh, reflections uh, on, 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 the, on mind-body dualism uh, of certain kind in Aristotle's works uh, also. Now again, uh, to, to understand uh, Aristotle's uh, take uh, on the issue of mind-body dualism, uh, we could uh, read again a passage from, uh, from uh, the, the same text, namely uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. Uh, so Aristotle did not believe in platonic forms existing independently of their uh, instances. Aristotelian forms, uh, the capital F has disappeared. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, in Aristotelian forms, uh, the capital F, so to speak, disappears with their standing as autonomous entities. Uh, as opposed to that, forms, uh, you know, uh, Aristotelian forms are the natures and properties of things and exist embodied in those things. This enabled Aristotle to explain the union of body and soul by saying that the soul is the form of the body. This means that a particular person's soul is no more than his nature as a human being. Because this seems to make the soul into a property of the body, uh, it led many interpreters, both ancient and modern, to interpret his theory as materialistic. The interpretation of Aristotle's philosophy of mind and indeed of his whole doctrine of form remains as live an issue today as it was immediately after his death. This is a passage from, uh, from Robinson uh, and, and uh, Rotti and Nussbaum also talk about it uh, in their work uh, uh, in 1992. So, so uh, Aristotle gives a very important turn to uh, you know, this, this uh, issue by by uh, by positing that uh, that uh, uh, soul is something that is already uh, in connection with the body so as we know that uh, aristotle's uh, idea you know about forms is is uh, is teleological in nature so according to him the form of a thing is uh, the goal that is that it is aspiring towards so say for example uh, the goal of uh, of uh, goal of uh, of a banyan uh, of of seed of a banyan tree is uh, you know to 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 become a full fledged banyan tree sometime so uh, so the the being of the seed of banyan trees is, is so soul of you know so to speak the 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 banyan tree, uh, the seed of the banyan tree is defined in terms of what it is aspiring for so uh, in aristotle's uh, metaphysics forms are not something that are otherworldly that are abstract immaterial in nature forms are rather something that are already within us and forms are something that uh, give us, you know, an impetus towards uh, a certain telos, certain end, certain goal uh, that, uh, you know, we move towards. And, and uh, you know, our being, so to speak, our existence um, becomes defined, comes to have meaning at all in terms of uh, the telos that we are moving towards. So, uh, in a certain way, Aristotle uh, seems to answer a question which is not even raised uh, in, in, in philosophically, which is not uh, even, uh, uh, which, which Plato doesn't even talk about, but, uh, you know, some, that, that is something that he must talk about if, if uh, you know, if uh, there has to be any, uh, there has to be a proper account of uh, these two different uh, levels of being, so to speak, namely intellect or soul and 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 uh, body, if they have to uh, coexist at all, and which they do in a human being, uh, uh, and, you know. They, so so that that uh, that kind of uh, connection between the two needed to be explained, which Plato doesn't doesn't seem to do. In Aristotle, we find some kind of an answer uh, forthcoming in that regard, where uh, you know Aristotle thinks that uh, in any uh, sort of, uh, in anything, not only human being, in anything, uh, the, 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 the material nature and the form, 
form which uh, which you know defines its stilos which defines its goal uh, you know it, which defines uh, uh, what it what it's becoming is towards so these two things are already uh, are inevitably always given together in the existence of uh, anything which includes uh, human beings as well so as human beings uh, you know we also sort of uh, you know we, we have a soul and and you know which defines uh, which which you know which which uh, which defines our telos which defines our goal and and uh, and and uh, this is how this is how aristotle uh, uh, looks at the problem of of uh, mind and body uh, but uh, uh you know to 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 talk further about about uh, aristotle uh, le- let me read uh, uh, let me continue with the passage that uh, we earlier read so nevertheless uh, the text makes it clear that aristotle believed that the intellect though part of the soul differs from other faculties in not having a bodily organ his argument for this constitutes a more tightly argued case than plato's for the immateriality of thought and hence for a kind of dualism he argued that the intellect must be immaterial because if it were material it could not receive all forms just as the eye because of its particular physical nature is sensitive to light but not to sound uh, and the ear to sound and not to light so if the intellect were in a physical organ uh it could be sensitive only to a restricted range of physical things but this is not the case for we can think about any kind of material object as it does not have a material organ its activity must be essentially immaterial so uh the problem that plato raises uh you know sort of uh, almost as if uh, enters through the back door uh, you know so uh, uh, the, the, uh, when when we talk about uh, you know the nature of things then uh, there the, you know we find that uh, certain uh, you know certain organs uh, have affinity towards uh, certain functions and this you know in a certain way brings uh, brings back the same issue from the back door uh, to to understand a little better uh 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 so 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 you know what it means is that uh, that that uh, aristotle also defined soul in terms of its function and soul therefore uh, you know since its function is uh, in a certain way immaterial in nature therefore uh, soul all in 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 his in his framework too has to have a different nature so uh soul and and body uh have different so to speak uh, nature for for uh, for aristotle uh, as well uh, even though he believes that uh, both of them uh, you know kind of coexist uh, right from the beginning uh, in in the very being of something both both coexist uh now to read uh, uh, to understand you know the difference between uh, plato and 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 aristotle a little better on on the issue of uh, mind and body uh, uh let me read uh, a passage from uh, encyclopedia britannica uh, uh plato mentioned and attempted to refute alternative accounts of the relationship of soul and body including a pythagorean view that described the soul as an attunement of the body and thus tried to explicate it as a form or structure rather than an independently existent thing existing thing a theory of this kind was worked out but not taken to its logical conclusion by aristotle in his treatise the anima uh, which means on the soul aristotle defined soul in terms of functions uh, the soul of a plant was concerned with nutrition and reproduction that of an animal with these and with sensation and independent movement that of man with all these and with the rational activity the soul was in each case the form of somebody and the clear implication of this was that it would disappear as the body in question dissolved to be more accurate the soul was the principle of life in something material it needed the material element to exist although it was not itself either material or immaterial 
but to put it crudely an abstraction. So here you know you find uh, in a certain way an answer which which you know which we raised earlier. Uh, Aristotle thinks that uh, each each thing is has has a particular uh, you know has a particular unique uh, function and function that function is defined in terms of what it's uh, reaching towards since everything in the universe exists uh, you know for uh, for some end for some goal to be achieved for some telos to be achieved and and uh, and uh, that is you know that is what uh, in a certain way constitutes the form of of uh, uh, that that thing but since uh, since you know form exists uh, in 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 the material uh, itself therefore uh, both are uh, together uh, and if that is the case that would also mean that uh, that uh, when the material thing goes then uh, you know the form of it also goes so uh, basically in his framework uh, you know we could we can understand his framework uh, this way that that uh, that uh, uh, that that forms uh, uh, you know require Require some kind of material uh, to 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 be to be there at all, and and certainly, and you know, once uh, once uh, uh, the material is 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 gone, then uh, you know, form in a certain way, we, there there would be no meaningful way of talking about uh, f about uh, forms. So so uh, in a certain way, this is why uh, some scholars of, of Aristotle uh, also you know uh, think that that his interpretation of uh, you know of, of uh, uh, mind and body uh, dualism is is um, more inclined uh, towards materialism, but is more inclined towards materialism, which basically would mean that uh, that that. Uh, uh, material uh, you know is 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 uh, very much uh, a kind of uh, locus uh, this is where you know the soul is located and if, if that is the case then uh, then soul uh, you know in in certain inevitable way in some uh, you know in, in some necessary uh, essential way uh, is always uh, connected with the, with the, with the body so both uh, sort of have some inevitable uh, kind of uh, uh, co-arising so to speak and soul you know names here seems to depend uh, on, 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 on the material or on the body as such. So, uh, so uh, this is how you know, we find that uh, in, in Aristotle, in Aristotle uh, we find some kind of an answer to, to the question regarding uh, you know the mind and body. Uh, uh, you know, sort of, the, the, we find an answer to the what kind of connection could be there between mind and body. Uh, we find some kind of uh, you know traces of an answer in Aristotle, but but uh, something that we don't uh, explicitly find in in Plato's uh, philosophy. So now to sort of uh, to complete the passage that we were earlier reading, uh, even though Aristotle was clearly committed by everything he said in the earlier parts of uh, the Enema. To the view that the soul is not anything substantial, he nevertheless distinguished towards the end of his work between what he called the active and the passive intellects and spoke of the former in platonic terms. The active intellect uh, was, it appears, separate from the rest of the soul. It came from outside and was in fact immortal. It was moreover essential to the soul, considered as rational, for without this nothing thinks. Aristotle thus showed the platonic side of his thought in the very act of trying to emancipate himself from this aspect of Platonism. So uh, later on uh, in his work, uh, Aristotle differentiates between what he calls active and passive intellect. And uh, and and uh, active intell intellect, uh, you know, is, is is supposed to be immortal uh, even for Aristotle. The moment we bring uh, immortality uh, into the picture, then uh, by very definition, by you know this very property, uh, it becomes of a different nature. It will have to sort of you know consider it to uh, consider it to be consider it to be of a different nature than material. Because uh, material uh, you know by definition, by its very nature is is not something that is eternal. Anything that is material uh, you know 
comes and goes and also uh, you know changes uh, its its nature so it, you know also goes through some kind of uh, uh, you know certain kind of modifications and therefore uh, uh, there is you know sort of nothing so to speak uh, eternal about it uh, same holds for our bodies but uh, since he believed, uh, since Aristotle also believed uh, that uh, that uh, active intellect was immortal, therefore uh, he falls into the same uh, uh, same uh, philosophical issues, falls into the same trap ultimately, and uh, you know the same question regarding some how something of a different nature could be connected with something which is of an entirely different nature. Uh, in a certain way remains unanswered because if intellect were passive uh, you know as, as, as considered in this distinction if it were passive only then uh, there wouldn't have been much of a problem in, in Aristotle's uh, uh, framework but since uh, he also talks about active intellect which is immortal so in, in, in terms of uh, active uh, intellect this problem uh, would uh, would would you know sort of raise his his head once again. So uh, now, having uh, looked at uh, how this uh, problem, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, how how this problem is 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 conceived in uh, in some uh, sort of very early times, uh, especially in Greek thought. Of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the same kind of issues also are raised in in. Uh, in even Indian philosophy, there is this uh, very famous uh, school of Indian philosophy, namely Sankhya, where uh, uh, everything in the world is, is, is viewed in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Prakriti and Purusha, and, and uh, Prakriti is supposed to be, uh, you know, completely of the nature of material, and uh, Purusha is, uh, you know, is, is viewed as a very different kind of principle, which is uh, completely non-physical and which is uh, considered of the nature of pure consciousness. And uh, you know these these two principles, which which account for everything in the universe, are supposed to be of uh, you know are supposed to be entirely different in essence. So they are supposed to be of a very different nature altogether. And uh, and and you know the same problem arises there as well. One of the main uh, main objections that is. Uh, uh, that is offered against uh, against Sankhya is that uh, you know uh, how there could be any connection between the two, uh, and and uh, if there is no connection between the two, then uh, prakriti, which is supposed to be a kind of a binding factor upon upon Purusha. Uh, that 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 uh, you know that uh, sort of so to speak uh, prakriti binding the purusha uh, uh, that that could not happen. Uh, so uh, any kind of uh, dualist account of of uh, mind and body, uh, like in the case of Sankhya philosophy as well, has to has to has to deal uh, with uh, this uh, issue, uh, namely something uh, you know if if uh, if uh, if uh, you know universe as such has both these elements then there are two ways of talking about it. either that uh, you know there is no coordination there is there is uh, no kind of connection between the two uh, or uh, there has there is some kind of a connection uh, you know between between uh, the two but we cannot say that there cannot be any connection between the two because uh, we know you know at least sort of if nothing else we know that material things exist so knowing itself is a kind of uh, you know connection with with the with the material thing so in in in, in sankhya philosophy uh, you know purusha uh, is this is this nature is uh, you know defined in terms of pure consciousness and uh, you know it's it's not free because it thinks of itself as uh, as as if uh, you know it it belonged to prakriti or it was as if it were connected to prakriti in some way so it has to retrieve you know the consciousness or retrieve itself uh, you know from from uh, its identification with the world of pra prakriti but if uh, if prakriti and purush are uh, of different nature altogether then there can be no direct connection between the two and that being the case uh, you know it, it it would appear as a flaw 
in 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 uh, in uh, sankhya philosophy as well so therefore uh, the, the the moral of the story here is that uh, uh, you know any kind of dualist account uh, has to face this problem so 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 far we saw uh, how you know we first of all uh, discussed what exactly uh, you know we understand uh, by uh, mind body problem uh, and then uh, there you know we saw that uh, the main problem there is that uh, mind uh, you know seems to be uh, seems to belong to a different category altogether uh, which is uh, you know completely sort of uh, which which is something purely abstract and something uh, purely immaterial uh, whereas body is something uh, something which is physical and material and uh, since uh, in a human being both are always together therefore uh, some kind of coordination needs to be needs to be there and that needs to be explained because if uh, there are two things of completely different nature we cannot talk about any connection between the two and we discussed in that line uh, what are the different kinds of problems uh, namely ontological and and epistemological and uh, when we are talking about uh, mind body dualism our main concern is with the ontological issue that uh, you know on sort of uh, uh, ontologically speaking human being are both minds and bodies and uh, you know uh, we need to understand their nature and and uh, we need to sort of explain the connection between between the two and uh, we also saw that uh, mind body problem is uh, even though you know we generally believe that uh, it's its very first uh, time formulated has a, a proper physical uh, a proper philosophical formulation of of mind body problem is this found uh, in in uh, descartes uh, and in his you know meditations on first philosophy uh, uh, but but even though the first systematic formulation is found in in uh, rene descartes uh, the <clears throat> it is in a certain way uh, anticipated uh in some uh you know by in in, in philosophies propounded by some of the uh, very sort of early uh greek thinkers as well as uh, you know in in, in the ancient uh, uh in the ancient uh, uh, philosophical uh, systems uh, you know in in india as well and we saw there how uh, you know plato when he talks about uh, body as defined in terms of its its uh, its appetites and uh, and intellection being uh, you know the main uh, i mean function so to speak of soul uh, and how and and sense you know form so to speak which which uh, give any meaning to the world at all are of immaterial uh, nature we are beyond uh, are beyond uh, time space contingency therefore something that is connected with it uh you know uh, namely intellection and 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 the and 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 uh, and the process uh, you know which is uh, like the, and and the and and uh, the organ which is uh, responsible for for this function namely soul it has to be of the same nature uh, as forms namely uh, it has to be also immaterial so there is this rift uh, you know between mind and body because uh, mind is uh, mind or soul has to be uh, of immaterial nature whereas body is uh, you know of material nature and and how we also saw how this problem that occurs uh, that you know comes to the fore uh, uh, namely uh, we need to explain how these two get united uh in a human being uh that uh plato does not answer satisfactorily and as a matter of fact he you know he doesn't uh, he doesn't seem to be bothered about this question much he just thinks that uh, that uh you know human being has uh, these different faculties and uh, these fic- these different faculties are very very different uh, you know planes uh, which which are uh, sort of you know which have their horizontal expansion so to speak but vertically they they don't seem to connect uh so so uh, but in aristotle we find uh, you know some kind of uh, an, an an answer to this question because for aristotle uh a uh, form uh, which is uh, immaterial is is uh, is so to speak as if interwoven 
uh, with the material uh, and makes material uh, you know makes the material think uh, oriented towards a particular goal so this is how you know sort of uh, both seem to kind of combine together in human person and and uh, and and uh, uh, this is how you know this this the question regarding uh, mind and body uh, seems to be anticipated in a certain way by aristotle so dear friends uh, we will uh, uh look at how descartes uh, you know raises uh, this problem regarding mind and body and how he sort of for the first time in the history of philosophy uh gives a proper uh, philosophical formulation to to this issue and we'll see what uh, how what what answer uh, he has on offer to this uh, problem so we'll we'll uh, talk about that in the next lecture so that's all for today thank you Thank you so thank you so very much for giving us a precious session and dear friends this was the first part in the future sessions also we would be discussing uh, more on uh, uh, mind body dualism and uh, dear friends if you want to give your feedback for today's lecture then do write to us at info.cec@nic.in we would be meeting again tomorrow and would be discussing more till then take care goodbye thank you so thank, thank you so very much